Hist, 3710, Nazism, Stalinism, and the Rise of the Total State. This is the week seven lecture on terror. So last week in our discussion of propaganda, we explored the regime's attempts to manipulate public opinion. That is the ways in which they used their monopoly over the media to bolster popular support and to mobilize the population to take part in regime campaigns. In a sense, that was all about encouraging and reinforcing popular conformity in, uh, to regime values. And today we're looking at a rather darker side of the same issue, at the extent to which the regimes use the political police to root out and destroy any and all non-conformity all real and potential opposition. And I would encourage you to look at the essay questions uh, at this point, because there is one uh, essay question that relates to this issue. So one of the things we want to be thinking about is, would these regimes have survived without recourse to terror? And a second question that we might want to ponder is whether the populations of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union under Stalin lived in fear of the political police. Was society uh, atomized, uh, as Friedrich and Brzezinski put it? What, what do we mean by this word atomized? Well, an atomized society, according to Friedrich and Brzezinski, is one with no social or cultural space no protected enclaves, is one of their phrases, in which dissatisfied or oppressed groups can mobilize and effect resistance. Let me read that again. An atomized society is one with no social or cultural space, no protected enclaves, in which dissatisfied or oppressed groups can mobilize and effect resistance resistance, that is an atomized society. Was society in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union under Stalin atomized? Okay. Certainly, both of these regimes used terror from their very origins. In the course of the Nazi rise to power, the SA, that is the Sturmabteilung, the stormtroopers, or brown shirts as they're sometimes known, the SA had terrorized Nazi opponents, particularly the communists, where possible, making it very, very difficult, if not impossible, for them to participate in the electoral process. Once in power, the task of dealing with the opponents of the regime shifted largely to the Gestapo, that is to say, the Geheime Staatspolizei, or the state secret police. Though we should also include in this list the SS, the Schutzstaffeln, or the elite guards, and the uh, SD, or the Sicherheitsdienst, the security service. That is, there are sort of various parallel organs of terror in Nazi Germany. In the Soviet Union, the secret police had been created by Lenin, and its first incarnation was the Cheka, uh, which is the uh, sort of uh, a shortened uh, 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 an a a acronym, as it were, for Czerwyczajna Komisja, or the Extraordinary Commission, in its longer uh, 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 iteration. It's the Extraordinary Commission Against Counter-Revolution, Sabotage, and Speculation. So the Cheka is the first political police of the USSR. Um, so the Cheka in the Soviet Union is, uh, as the name suggests, combating all organizations and individuals or classes, really, as the, 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 the regime thought, which pose themselves in opposition to the regime, that is, all enemies of the regime, as the regime chose to define them. And they sort of identified kind of priority targets uh, at various stages. So they uh, were at times uh, 
bourgeois specialists or kulaks or speculators, Trotskyists or fascist spies. Um, the Soviet political police then went through several incarnations over the next 30 years from the Chaka, we had the GPU, the uh, OGPU then followed by the NKVD. So GPU stands for Gasudarstvene Politicheske Upravlenia, I don't know why I bother to give you this Russian, or Unified State Political Administration. And then NKVD stands for, uh, I, I won't bother with the Russian, for People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. And they're all basically charged with the, the same task, which is identifying and dealing with all internal and external enemies of the regime. Okay. Um, we certainly don't want in the process of this lecture to make light of the apparatus of terror in these countries. So, you know, as I've been suggesting, uh, both regimes had political police forces directed specifically at the task of uncovering and rooting out uh, real and potential opposition. And both, uh, and this is worth uh, underlining here, both regimes defined opposition very broadly. So both had an extensive network of agents that reported the state of popular opinion and that kept a vigilant watch uh, for evidence that discontent could become opposition. And I would encourage you in this uh, element to read uh, the work of Sheila Fitzpatrick and Robert Galatoly, a book a uh, collection of uh, articles under the title Accusatory Practices. Uh, and uh, the introductory essay in particular in this, in this book identifies the exact figures for the network of agents uh, working for the political police in these two countries. And it's striking enough that in there's a very big distinction to be had between uh, the agent network in Nazi Germany and the USSR. So in Nazi Germany, it's 32,000 agents uh, monitoring uh, popular opinion. And in the USSR, it's 366,000, according to that book. So more than, than 10 times the size. Make of that what you will, that comparison between Nazi Germany and Soviet Germany. Both political police forces, just to continue here, um, had extraordinary powers and were at times freed from any legal control. So contemplate these together, right? They define opposition very broadly, okay? They're freed from any legal control and they have a vast agent network identifying where expressions of discontent could become opposition. They're really quite sort of awesome uh, forces within these, these societies. Now, arrest at the hands of the political police in Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union could very easily lead to execution or to exile to concentration camps, of which both these regimes had substantial systems. And here I would encourage you to read an article by Stephen Wheatcroft called The Scale and Nature of German and Soviet Repression and Mass Killings. And that you'll find on JSTOR. Uh, so Stephen Wheatcroft, PH, Wheatcroft, The Scale and Nature of German and Soviet Repression and Mass Killings. Um, very briefly, he uh, uh, identifies the camp population in Nazi Germany at the beginning of, of the Nazi regime, 50,000. Uh, that's 1933, uh, rising to 133,000 in 1939 and 800,000 in 1945. Initially, the camp system in Nazi Germany is populated with socialist and communist opponents of the regime, but by the end of the 1930s and, the, uh, and through the war, the camps were not used to isolate 
the enemies of the regime. They were really used to exterminate the Jews of Europe. Now, by contrast, the population of the Soviet camp system, referred to as the Gulag, and please hear it's the whole system is the Gulag. So Gulag stands for Государственное управление лагерей, that is the state administration of labor camps, and you do not refer to one as a Gulag. The whole system is the Gulag. So you can talk about a labor camp of the Gulag. Ooh, that's an aside. Okay, so the population of the Soviet camp system expanded from a few tens of thousands to about 200,000 uh, in 1930 in the process of the regime crushing opposition to collectivization. So uh, wholesale collectivization really begins in earnest in the winter of 1929-1930 and by 1931 the camp population had essentially expanded by a factor of 15 or 20 to, as I said, about 200,000. But by the uh, end of the Great Terror of 1937 to 38, the population of Soviet labor camps had expanded to in excess of a million. Um, and that was a period, 37 to 38, when the regime was obsessively concerned to uncover masked counter-revolutionary enemies of the regime, to unmask conspiracies, spies, and saboteurs. So, if we're briefly to summarize the content of the last sort of 10 minutes of this lecture, it is to say that both of these regimes were unquestionably murderous and on a grand scale. But that alone doesn't answer the questions that we posed at the very beginning. Okay? So what we need to think about again are these questions. Did the population at large live in fear of arrest and exile to concentration camps? Did the regimes intend that their citizenry should live in fear? Was fear necessary to the success of their respective revolutions? Well, Friedrich and Brzezinski and other proponents of the totalitarian model that we've discussed now in lectures and in seminars, Friedrich and Brzezinski argue that they did, that is, that fear was necessary to the success of these revolutions, and that the citizenry did live in fear, and that the regime did intend that they should live in fear. So, writing in the mid-1950s, they argue that the Nazi and Stalin revolutions were grandiose schemes of social reconstruction and human remolding that necessarily encountered opposition. Okay, and let me quote um, from their work, Totalitarian Dictatorship and Autocracy. So, quote, It is this determination to achieve total change that begets terror. Change always entails opposition. In a free society, total change cannot occur because it would bring forth massive resistance from a variety of groups and interests. In a totalitarian society, opposition is prevented from developing by the organization of a total terror, which eventually engulfs everyone. And then to continue this quote further down the page, quote, terror is the fundamental method for achieving the total goals of the regime and of maintaining the permanent revolution. All of which is to say the terror in Germany is necessary to achieve a total mobilization for war um, and for the extermination of the Jews. And terror in the Soviet Union was necessary to achieve collectivization, rapid industrialization, and other economic and political campaigns in the process of building a socialist and ultimately communist society. Now, most scholars who wrote at the height of the Cold War would agree fundamentally with Friedrich and Brzezinski's assessment. 
And if you look at the, uh, the, the longer reading list for this module, you can identify here those who shared this opinion. So I would encourage you to look uh, not only at Friedrich and Brzezinski, but at Hannah Arendt, at Barrington Moore, Merle Feinsod, Robert Conquest, Hans Buchheim, Edward Crankshaw and others. So, I mean, generally it's a useful thing to look at the dates. So they're writing in the 40s, the 50s, and the early 60s and anticipate uh, that there's a high probability that you'll, you'll find that they do broadly sympathize with that, with that view. And certainly when you're writing your essays, uh, you know, be very conscious of this, how the, how the evolution evolves. And really the reason I identify these authors is that so that you can compare them to the views of those who follow, the so-called revisionists, okay? So for the Soviet Union, for Soviet history, you might want to compare the views of the authors I just mentioned with those of Robert Thurston, Sarah Davis, uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick, and on, uh, the, on, on Nazi Germany, uh, compare uh, uh, the views of Hans Buchheim and Edward Crankshaw, among others, with those of Detlef Poikert, Richard Bessel, Richard Grunberger, and various others uh, from, the, from the 60s and, and 70s. So, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the study of history was largely a study of political history. So historians of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union focused on political institutions and their leaders because they perceived that as being what mattered, right? So if you have a total terror and it is controlled, population is manipulated, society is atomized, it really is only the highest echelons of power that matter. Um, but in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, social history was increasingly in vogue. And rather than look at the actions of leaders, social historians told the story of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union from the perspective of ordinary Germans and Russians. And their research, often based on the public opinion reports of the political police, told a very different story. So, for example, Detlev Poikert, in his book Inside Nazi Germany, found that the presence of the political police did not stifle uh, dissent. In fact, ordinary Germans and Russians uh, were constantly grumbling, constantly complaining and passively resisting state policies. But that passive resistance was combined with at least a passive acceptance of their respective regimes and an outright enthusiasm for some elements of state policy. Okay, so we want to consider the enthusiasm for elements of state policy, because this is something that was exceptionally controversial in the 60s and 70s, uh, controversial about the work of revisionists, this idea that people could have uh, supported elements of the policies of these regimes. Okay. So, for example, in Nazi Germany, the regime won considerable support for foreign policy successes. And as the Nazis came to power, the reparations demands of the Versailles Treaty were ultimately withdrawn. The French evacuated the Tsar Valley. The Rhineland was remilitarized. So there seemed to be, under the Nazis, an end to the humiliations that Germany had endured since the end of World War I. At the same time, the German public also tended to credit the Nazis for the German economic miracle. So GNP, gross national product, rose from 58 billion marks in 1932 to 93 billion marks by the end of the 1930s, from 58 to 93 billion marks. Unemployment which uh, affected over a third of the workforce in the early 1930s, was eventually overcome, and incomes and the volume of consumer goods 
tend to exceed their levels of the 1920s. So you have to imagine just how devastating the impact of the depression was in Germany and how uh, uh, powerful the impact of the German uh, four-year plans uh, was through the 1930s to understand uh, how uh, important that was for popular opinion of the Nazi regime. And I suppose thirdly we should add that the Germans credited the Nazis for achieving a measure of political stability after so many years of crises. crisis. So Weimar Germany had been badly politically split between left and right, between uh, all sorts of interests and coalitions rose and fell and weeder, leaders appeared weak uh, the, uh, by the late 20s and early 30s. Uh, political battles, pitched political battles uh, uh, happening on the streets as sort of communists fight those uh, sort of um, paramilitary groups on the right. Uh, so this is depressing uh, for a great many people who want order and stability, which the, the Nazis seem to bring. And yet support for the Nazis did have its limits. So as we know, uh, the foreign policy successes did not continue indefinitely. Unemployment uh, had been overcome, but incomes did not uh, uh, rise uh, uh, at the same rate as uh, GNP, because the vast majority of added national income was ploughed into military spending. And while incomes stagnated, the prices of food and consumer goods continued to rise. And prices, uh, and occasionally shortages, rising prices and shortages, produced the most dissatisfaction with the regime. But they weren't the only source. So, for example, Nazi attacks on Christian churches provoked considerable anger. Though attacks on synagogues, and Jewish businesses and individual Jews drew a relatively muted response. And there was also some irritation at Nazi propaganda. So Germans had been excited by the sense of dynamism about the Nazis, but the constant rallies and parades soon devolved into a sort of imposed political ritual that frankly got on people's nerves. So in short, Popular approval of Nazi policies was conditioned upon the regime's ability to meet people's everyday needs. So what about terror? Ironically, terror itself won approval. And here I would encourage you to read in particular the work of, of Robert Galatoly. Um, after so many years of crisis and national humiliation under the Weimar Republic, Germans tended to embrace the Nazis' notion of a people's community, a Volksgemeinschaft, and the rallying of the popular will. So they tended to accept regimentation, subservience, and the forced participation in regime campaigns as necessary to the real stability and success of the new regimes. So ordinary Germans tended not to object to the Gestapo rounding up particularly socialists and communists, and they accepted terror as part of a strict policy of law and order. And here you have the revisionist view, uh, which very starkly contrasts with the uh, totalitarian model, but is not without elements of controversy, which I would encourage you to wade into. But let me compare the situation in Nazi Germany with that in the Soviet Union. So do we find a similar story is our question. And indeed, there are many parallels between, for example, Poikert's findings and those of Sarah Davis in her book, Popular Opinion in Stalin's Russia. 
So Sarah Davis, looking at the reports of the political police, the NKVD, on popular opinion, Davis did uncover the same pattern of grumbling, of complaint and passive resistance. That is to say, not a pattern of a population living in fear of the political police. Similarly, Davis also uncovers significant sources of popular support for the regime. And this was not her discovery, for back in the, the uh, late 1970s, Sheila Fitzpatrick wrote in uh, her book, Education and Social Mobility uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, that there was a vast program of industrialization initiated by Stalin that created hundreds of thousands of new jobs and new opportunities for ordinary Soviet citizens. So everyone is sort of, well, not everyone, but very large numbers are uh, enjoying this uh, social mobility. Uh, peasants moving to cities, moving from a situation where they were living on the verge of starvation, to coming into cities, learning new trades, and gaining uh, a stability that they had lacked before. And uh, also a story of millions of young Soviet citizens graduating from educational institutions. So do we find a similar story in the Soviet Union? Well, indeed there are many parallels between Poikert's findings and those of Sarah Davis in her book, Popular Opinion in Stalin's Russia. Looking at the reports of the political police, the NKVD, on popular opinion, Davis uncovered the same pattern of grumbling, of complaint, and of passive resistance. That is to say, not a pattern of a population living in fear of the political police. And similarly, Davis uncovered significant sources of social support for the regime. Now, this was not entirely her discovery, for back in the 1970s, uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick, in her book, Education and Social Mobility in the Soviet Union, pointed out that the vast program of industrialization initiated by Stalin created hundreds of thousands of new jobs and new opportunities for Soviet, ordinary Soviet citizens. So, for example, poor peasants living on the verge of starvation came to cities and learned new trades. And factory workers became managers. Millions of young Soviet citizens who graduated from Soviet educational institutions were catapulted into positions of power and authority in Stalin's new order. So like Poikert's ordinary Germans who supported the Nazi regime because of concrete economic benefits they derived, millions of Soviet citizens credited Stalin for their remarkable social advancement. So then we can pose this question we posed at the, at the beginning. Did the Soviet and Nazi regimes need terror for their survival? Well, the work of the social historians presents a significant challenge to the totalitarian school. The so-called determination to achieve total change, of which Friedrich and Brzezinski wrote, did not necessarily, again to quote them, bring forth the massive resistance that Friedrich and Brzezinski had expected. In fact, those total transformations generated a lot of social support, not that there wasn't a lot of resistance. So, Hitler arrested and imprisoned thousands of German socialists, communists, and members of other non-Nazi political parties and organizations. Stalin was only able to complete the collectivization of agriculture by openly crushing the resistance of the mass of the peasantry. Over a million peasants were exiled to the system of labor camps, that is the gulag, in the process. And of course, the victims of Stalin's terror were not limited to the peasantry. So by 1937, the regime was at work arresting and executing tens of thousands of party officials, 
so we shouldn't be too quick to dismiss the views of the totalitarian school. To what extent, you may want to ask, have the revisionists gone too far in playing down the importance of terror to these regimes? So you may wish to observe that the fear of the political police was not generalized, but that certain groups in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union had better reason to fear uh, the political police than others. So, for example, communists, socialists, Jews, Sinti and Roma, homosexuals, the handicapped uh, in Nazi Germany had much more reason to fear. Uh, and in the case of the Soviet Union, wealthy peasants, members of former oppositions, bourgeois specialists, and senior party officials also had more reason to fear than others. Of course, there are other approaches to this topic. So, for example, the proponents of the totalitarian model argue that the Nazi and Stalinist regimes induced a generalized fear with an increasingly powerful and pervasive police apparatus. Well, in the last 10 years, there's been considerable research on the actual workings of the apparatus of terror, which would indicate that the number of paid agents of the political police forces was actually relatively small and that the political police in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union would not have been effective if it hadn't been for the voluntary participation of ordinary Germans and Russians. So the number of agents meant that the Gestapo and the NKVD needed the information voluntarily provided by ordinary citizens in order to track the enemies of, of their respective regimes. So denunciation, rather than being a product of fear or fanaticism, was a matter of everyday life in these countries. Well, why denounce? Well, again, we return to this measure of social support that these regimes enjoyed. Ordinary Soviet citizens denounced their uh, fellows who were, for example, hiding their class origins or who might have been abusing authority. Ordinary Germans similarly denounced those who abused their authority or, for example, who may have been violating laws discriminating against Jews. And this is what Robert Galatoly refers to as self-policing. Now, not all denunciations were welcome in these regimes, so Germans and Soviet citizens were also inclined to denounce for personal gain, that is, to get revenge against a personal enemy, to eliminate an undesirable neighbor, or to remove a rival. And both these regimes at various times took measures to combat these false denunciations. But crucially, these voluntary denunciations were the single largest source of information collected by the political police forces. So what does that say about the importance of the system of terror to these regimes? Well, you may choose to conclude that the weakness of the police apparatus indicates that inducing a generalized fear was not so important to these regimes. You may choose to conclude that if ordinary citizens were terrorized, they were terrorizing themselves. But on the other hand, you may also consider the possibility that the crucial fact was not the actual dimensions of the agent network of the political police, but the perception that it was all pervasive. Perhaps the regimes didn't have a larger network of agents because it didn't need one. And again, it's for you to decide whether the research undermines this image of a generalized terror in the totalitarian model and the notion that the regime needed terror for its survival. Now, the other thing that I would encourage you to do um, in following up on this lecture is to look at the work of political police forces in uh, the democratic states. So I would encourage you to then start to compare and contrast the work of the NKVD and Gestapo on the one hand with that, for example, of the FBI in the United States and MI5 in, the, in Great Britain. So I will remind you what I said in the, in the introductory lecture 
with, which is that, for example, there was no protection against arbitrary arrest in Britain in the 1930s. Again, there's this uh, um, uh, essay topic, uh, at least at the time I'm giving this lecture, on uh, the political police forces in uh, the totalitarian states and, and Britain, uh, where you have to make an argument about whether political police forces in totalitarian and democratic states both served to stifle dissent. So do you must keep in mind that the political police did target communists, fascists, anarchists, trade union leaders, and so on, uh, for harassment and arrest. And in the case of the FBI, it might be helpful, and we'll have a seminar, again, at the time, at least, that I'm delivering this lecture, we'll have a seminar comparing um, the terror in the Soviet Union, 37-38, with the, this uh, uh, episode of McCarthyism, uh, in the United, uh, the United States in, in the 1950s. That is, we have a similar campaign of fear, similar use of political propaganda, of arrests, persecution, and, and sort of forced denunciations, the naming of names. So I think both of these will give us the opportunity to ask whether there is something unique and unprecedented about the uh, use of terror and of political policing. Uh, in democratic and totalitarian states. See you next week.